Okay, well, we're delighted to be here today. And by your presence, we know you have chosen to watch this particular presentation, which we call How the Advisory Council Fits into the Body of Christ or the Kairos Body. I keep changing the title. How the Advisory Council Fits into the Kairos Body. My name is Dick Spinning. I led my first Kairos Inside Weekend back in 1998. I've served on several advisory councils since then, which has always been a blessing. I've had the honor of serving as the Arizona State Committee Chair. And I've also, and I currently am the International Council representative representing the state of Arizona. My experience with Kairos has been one of a slowly evolving, deepening awareness of the breadth and diversity that is Kairos. So I have been blessed by many opportunities to learn about Kairos, and I'm I'm truly excited to share with you my experience with Kairos to perhaps help you see yourself in a broader sense of what your involvement with Kairos might be. And I'm Patty Fisk. I baked my first cookie for a guest of Virginia number one when my dad was serving on team. And the idea of passing on the life-changing hope of Christ's love in prisons was born. I served on support teams, and I finally got to take my guitar inside uh, nine years ago. I'm passionate about encouraging um, volunteers to pursue the best in Kairos and to always seek what God has in store. I found out I have a passion for training in Kairos six years ago. Who knew where we all would go? And um, so I'm excited to be here and um, share with you. Your presence here then indicates that you have dedication. You've made the effort to participate in this. You've got a sense of wanting to know more about what Kairos is. We find a blessing also in your integrity. Looking for the honesty that can be Kairos, practicing the values that are Kairos and being true to our faith in as disciples of Christ. Through your experience as an advisory council member, you have great knowledge. We know that from our own experience that you've learned so much as you've worked with Kairos ministry. And your presence here indicates as well that you are interested in excellence. You want to do the very best that you can in serving those we seek to serve on behalf of Christ. So we acknowledge that many people from different backgrounds are here. So some of you are currently members of advisory council. Some of you may be considering it. You might be new to an advisory council, or maybe you've been on advisory council and in leadership in Kairos forever. So we just want to um, welcome you. Also, our, we also know that we are one ministry with three parts. So are you part of Kairos outside, Kairos inside, or Torch? So the theme of this conference is find the blessings. And I have learned over and over that there are blessings no matter the circumstances in our lives. Romans 8.28, one of the first verses the Holy Spirit pierced my soul with when he snatched me out of that wild life I've been living to escape shame and guilt. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. There are blessings in every season, joyous and difficult ones. Time and time in the Bible, we find examples of people who experience with what others intended for evil. 
and God uses them to implement his plan, to bestow blessings on his children. Think of the blessings of Joseph, the favored son, sold by his jealous brothers. He served faithfully in Potiphar's household, but was accused of rape and sent to jail. He bided his time there. He used his gifts to serve those around him. He came to the attention of Pharaoh. He served Pharaoh well and ultimately saved the brothers who wanted him gone. The blessings of Esther, beloved and faithful niece, forced into marriage to a king she certainly wouldn't have chosen. She served her husband in his household that, in a household that hated and persecuted her people and ultimately answered the call to save them. And the ultimate of blessings, Jesus. He was persecuted and condemned by his own leaders because they feared losing power and position. They thought the threat was eliminated. Satan thought he'd won. We rejoice that God's redemptive plan was carried out. This admonition to find blessing in every circumstance didn't end when the last verse of the Bible was written, Revelations 22, 21, that says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people, amen. And his grace is still with us today. One of the hardest times for my family was when my daughter, 14, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. It was unexpected, unusual, unpleasant. We faced it knowing that God heals. We just took the next steps. I was a single parent of five. Her treatment required leaving her brothers behind for a week at a time over six months. I lost my job and she was trying to stay uh, up, keep up in school. The night she came down with clumps of hair, I cried while shaving her head, but she kept saying, it's okay, mom, it's okay. The blessing in it all, you see, before her illness, we were like World War III, she and I. She said in an eighth grade composition that she wouldn't give it up because she felt loved for the first time and had an appreciation for life that most people her age didn't have. I wouldn't trade it because the cancer gave us back our relationship. She wrote me a book of poetry for Mother's Day. Hard Times was one of those poems. She wrote, We've been through some of the hardest times ever, but remember, we always make it through the hardest and greatest times. But with each hard time brings us closer and more into one being. So I therefore challenge the hard times to come. Want to tell you and remind you that everyone here has a story to share. It's important to pass them on, to encourage each other with God's blessings, not just individually, but our stories in this ministry, our stories on advisory councils and in our communities. How has God been blessing you through this time? This last year has been unexpected, unusual, and unpleasant, but it has been filled with blessings. In all circumstances, if you seek them, you will find the blessings that God has prepared for you, individually and in this ministry. As we wait with great expectation for what God has next, and as we begin to reopen, we have the opportunity to rest in him, to get ready to answer his call for us to empower our communities and to grow. Well, thank you, Patty. What a story. Let's take a moment to pray together. Dear, dear Lord, we are so conscious of your presence with us at this moment. We know, Lord, you promised that whenever we gather together, you will be there with us. We are challenged, Lord, when you are with us to listen, to sense your will, and to take the steps necessary to accomplish that will. May this training this day and maybe our interactions in the future always be guided by the certainty of your presence in our lives and the knowledge that you have a purpose for what we are called to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen.
So we find the blessing of an advisory council as we learn about how it fit into what we've called the Kairos body. I'd like to take a few minutes to just to kind of specifically describe what that body is. This is not new information to you, but hopefully looking at it from a broader perspective will give us all an opportunity to see how we work together. Obviously, the first and foremost aspect of who we are is the, are the communities we serve, whether those are Kairos outside, Kairos inside, or torch communities. And we should keep in mind that those communities are actually defined and gathered by what we do or what you do as an advisory council. And all those activities of the advisory council, of course, are monitored and supported by the state chapter committee. That committee gives us a focus, it gives us support, and it gives us guidance as we seek to serve the communities we have brought together. The state chapter committee, of course, is directed by policy established by the district governing board or the Kairos governing board. That board in turn is informed, informed by the International Council representatives, representing each state, bringing information about concerns that may be about better ways of doing things, about what's going on on those front lines where we as advisory councils serve. They're a vital part of the Kairos body. And all of us, all of us are served, monitored, and informed by the Kairos prison ministry staff. Those people who so imaginatively put this conference together, who made it possible for us to be working together in this training video and the many, many things that they do to make it possible for us to perform our missions. And each part is necessary to the success of Cairo's Prison Ministry International. Imagine, if you will, if you remove any one of the pieces we have pictured here. Eliminate the communities we serve outside or inside, and we have no mission. Remove the advisory councils and immediately ministry to those that we serve ends. The work that you do on advisory councils is vital to fulfilling the vision of Kairos. It's so important that it ends without you. This is not to say that the rest of the body of Kairos is any less important, because if you remove the state chapter committee, that leaves our you on advisory council drifting on your own. Each part of Kairos is necessary to keep us in the riverbanks. Each part offers support, guidance, and resources that keep us serving with consistency and integrity. On our own, we would all drift away doing our own thing. Eventually, we would lose what makes Kairos prison ministry so impactful. Only linked together and working together within our states, internationally, with the board and staff, are we fully and truly Kairos Prison Ministry International? We certainly find the blessing in being part of something bigger than we are, bigger than us. The ecumenical underpinning of Kairos brings us into relationship with the community with a broad variety of faith backgrounds. And interacting with a broad variety of faith backgrounds gives us reason to come to a deeper understanding of what it is that we believe in. That's important to the functioning of the advisory council. As advisory councils, we serve a unique group of people, our ministry 
serves those impacted by incarceration. And of course, it has its unique challenges, the challenge of people who are in prison, the people who are responsible for those in prison, those we work with, the wardens, the, and the chaplains, those we work with on the outside who support us in so many different ways. They are people with a unique interest in prison ministry, and we benefit greatly from our relationship with those people who have this unique sense of what this ministry is. Kairos brings to our ministry as an advisory council, a wealth of experience gained over years of trial and error and documentation of what we do. The way we conduct our programs is based on that experience and information and strengthens us in that sense of how we can witness to people impacted by incarceration on behalf of our Lord Jesus. And as advisory councils, we are in a place where our membership in these large communities can most effectively serve those whom we see. That's something to keep in mind about the advisory council. It is in essence, the cutting edge where the work is done that makes the difference once we move into the prison or into a relationship with people outside who are impacted by that. So we are empowered by the possibilities, the experience, the knowledge and experience and the Christian background of those we work with. So Dick has shared that you are not alone and you're part of so much something bigger than just yourselves. And I'm gonna say, share with you that you are a force to be reckoned with. You are one of 33,000 volunteers serving over 500 communities in 10 countries. Your service is given a value of a mere $36 million. Cheap at that because the time and care you give is priceless. You are part of changing lives, changing families, and making changes that ripple into communities all over the world. But with that comes responsibility. Because you are not lone Christians, how you operate in your advisory councils has consequences. Our actions at the local level impact the entire international ministry. Serving in unity is central to the Kairos way. That is why you hear so much about reporting, about standards, and about training. MyKairos.org changes constantly, offering a wealth of resources for training and outreach tools. In preparing for this presentation, for example, I found a video on the homepage about how to navigate MyKairos.org that I had never seen before. I'm always so focused on the side where I look up my links. And you have an opportunity there to share the testimonies within your ministry about what is working on your advisory councils and in your communities. Your biggest challenge, I believe, on an advisory council is to quit trying to do all the work yourselves and figure out a way to share it. The work is bigger than just 14 people. You have armies of volunteers to mobilize. Most of us are here because someone invited us. How many of you have grown spiritually and are doing things you never thought you would do? How many of you have skills and gifts that surprise you now? All because of serving on Kairos. Make it your goal on advisory councils to manage your local community's understanding of the needs of the ministry and how they can participate in those needs. You have people who love Kairos, but are no longer able to participate on a full weekend, especially now after this pandemic. Do they know there is more to successful Kairos ministry than just teaming? Do you have people who have said no to a three-year term on advisory council, but might be willing to serve on a short-term project 
like a fundraising event or intermittently in recruiting? So again, and you're gonna hear this said throughout this training in different ways, but it was essentially the same idea. An advisory council structured as an integral part of the Kairos body is stronger in ministry and in service. We find the blessing of a strong advisory council. So let's talk about what a strong advisory council is. A strong advisory council to begin with is spiritually healthy. That impacts if you are spiritually healthy, the way that you can in integrate your faith into ministry to the community we serve. That's so important. We are provided through participation in a strong advisory council to the blessing of leadership development. We are provided the opportunity to strengthen our own leadership skills, to find skills that we didn't think we had, to become involved in activities that we did not imagine we could lead. But we also are involved in bringing others into leadership. When that's going on in the context of an advisory council, that makes you a strong advisory council and you can experience the blessings of that strength. In a strong advisory council, we learn the blessings or the strength of self-discipline. I'll say it again because you've heard it before, working within the riverbanks, submitting your own ad agenda to the needs of the ministry, ultimately to the mission that we are called to by Christ. But in the day-to-day -day operation of your advisory council to the steps and activities and limitations on what we can do to strengthen our ministry to those we seek to serve. The leaders we develop and ourselves are held to accountability. Being accountable is a blessing of a strong advisory council. You know that, don't you? Unless people are called to task, when they do not meet the expectations of the ministry, frustration abounds. Being accountable keeps us working, focused, and moving towards that ministry. Membership in a strong advisory council then leads to that spiritual growth as we focus our attention and how the ministry can be aligned with Christ's call to make disciples. A strong advisory council is always prayerfully seeking God's direction to address any issues in their community. It is aware of and is using all the tools available from mykairos.org and also the experience of all of our volunteers, local and state. They're willing to ask for help if they need it and direction. They are managing the local community's awareness of needs and taking advantage of the treasury of gifts that your volunteers hold. They're meeting organizational reporting standards and deadlines. They're developing relationships with institutions, with new volunteers, and with other advisory councils. They are prayerfully anticipating the future and being flexible in the face of change. A strong advisory council is accountable, as Dick told us, and holds leaders accountable. And they strive to set everyone up for success as we support each other. As a large art order, but remember, we've already talked about, you are not alone. Oops. 
we find the participation of an advisory council immersed in a vibrant volunteer community, we find the blessing of that vibrancy, of that interaction with a group of volunteers to strengthen what we do and how we do it. Being involved with a vibrant volunteer community means that we are constantly building up our team. We talk about team building sometimes as an isolated activity that takes place in preparation for a weekend. Team building should be take, taking place all the time as we increase that sense of connection we have with each volunteer who are also part of that body of Christ. We share with the vibrant volunteer community the common goals of our ministry. We know what it's about. We are to take the love of Christ to those who are impacted by incarceration. But when we do that, when we share common goals, we can model the work of Christ's disciples, who in turn, by in turn, strengthening our own witness. Community building is a common goal that a vibrant volunteer community shares. That sense of common purpose motivates us to strengthen and build the community in which we operate. We are part of a community of faith. We need to say that over and over again. We are part of a community of faith. So being part of a vibrant volunteer community enables us then to develop leaders who in turn develop leaders by having a plan to provide leadership opportunities. We can provide the opportunity as part of a vibrant volunteer community to engage in new and unfamiliar roles. Taking responsibility in areas that you're uncomfortable with, moving from one role to another, accepting responsibilities you're not certain you're prepared to do. Those are all things that enable you to grow and being part of a vibrant volunteer committee motivates you in fundamental ways to do that. Being part of a vibrant volunteer committee then enables you to spread the load, get other people involved. Those are cliches you hear all the time, but what it means is leaders are being lifted up, the strength of the community is being enhanced, and the opportunity to accomplish the mission becomes real. So we value active participation in a vibrant volunteer community. So there's no doubt that the last year has been challenging, but we've had the blessing of finding new and creative ways to connect with each other. We've had to think outside the box and do things differently. To the, and we wanted, we had to be creative in finding ways to, to connect with those we serve, but also with our volunteer communities. We've used Zoom to continue training. We've used it to have meetings. Some are using Zoom to create and maintain relationships within the body of volunteers even recruiting new people or at least introducing them to Kairos. Begin to think of ways to engage your volunteers together more often than just team formations. So think about integrating your activities, fundraising and recruiting work hand in hand and they gather us together also. Expand the idea of continuing ministry to include connection within your body of volunteers. Some examples, and I think that Kairos Outside has an advantage over the rest of us in that they have built into their program, share, witness, accountability, and prayer swap meetings. 
that's continuing ministry that's that's developed for the participants but it includes it's open to and includes the volunteers inside so many of us are limited by institutional guidelines to small numbers being able to go in for prayer and shares and connect think about having a prayer and share for those of us volunteers that are unable to go inside meet at the same time as those who are inside use the same format pray for our residents let them know that it is happening prayer is a powerful connector and imagine how encouraging it would be for them to know that they're not alone inside they have people praying for them have regular events to gather together and have some fun provide behind the scenes kairos training during these times people come to team and often know nothing about all that goes on outside of a weekend this is an opportunity also as i had said for fundraising and recruiting and continuing ministry to those we serve with and it's an opportunity to get to know one another and build relationships be creative and be patient because for some, this idea of getting together outside of teaming and doing something more for the ministry other than just being on a weekend will be new, and they may need to adjust to it. So we've talked a little bit about who we are as an advisory council. Now we're going to be talking for a few minutes about how, how we as an advisory council integrate ourselves into the broader body one of the very first things that we do is engage in effective leadership development we need to first of all as an advisory council make sure that we are bringing into leadership into the advisory council and into our volunteer or for those persons who meet the basic qualifications. Do they have a strong Christian ethos? Do they have an understanding of the mechanisms within Kairos that have been borrowed from fourth day communities? Do they do that in a way, do they have those, that prior knowledge and that prior information? If they don't, and even if they do, one of the responsibilities of leadership development is providing training and support. Advisory councils frequently, and I've been on these advisory councils, fall down by making the assumption that its members know what to do. More and often they don't. They're wondering, what is this all about? How am I supposed to do this? When am I supposed to do this? Rather than have isolated periodic training, training ought to be built into everything you do. Information providing ought to be in everything you do. And when we talk about supporting and developing leadership, that means questioning, holding accountable, and correcting and providing the opportunity to improve. Those are very important kinds of things. We talk about accountability a lot and it's been bandied about in the political systems and the religious institutions everywhere. Well, I'm gonna hold you accountable. Well, it's important, but often it's a cliche. What does it mean? It means having in place within your within your advisory council, accountability structures that are not punitive, they're not designed to pressure, but rather to lead to growth. When you assign an activity or you make a plan or you say, we're gonna do this, that part of that process ought to be, how do we know we get there? How do we know that our leaders are behaving ethically and within the discipline and in a way 
that lifts up our ministry. How do we measure that? How do we give feedback when they're doing a good job? And how do we correct when they need correction? That's what accountability means. It has to be built in, it has to be constant, and it has to be positive. So when we invite people to serve as weekend leaders, we on advisory councils have a responsibility to stay engaged with them and to support them, to provide an opportunity of them for them to be successful. Um, it is also our job to be noticing the people that to bring along that we can mentor. Um, I have a friend who, who saw something in a young woman and, and knew she was gonna be a leader. And she went out of her way to mentor her. She came alongside of her. She taught her about um, standing up for herself and being strong. She, not only in our ministry time, and church life, but also in her family. She made a change in that woman and she did lead a weekend. So we have to have vision for how we can bring people along. And once we've invited them to be uh, on leaders, ultimately um, we are responsible for making sure that that weekend is fulfilling for the participants and the volunteers because we don't wanna be recruiting people and then losing them because they had an unpleasant experience. So, is Ezra available and available when it's supposed to be? And is it being used? Maybe you have a weekend leader who's just not very good at computers and you need to give them support in those areas. Is the excellent initiative, it has value before, during and after teaming to keep things on track. And we use that data to, to constantly be, be constantly improve. Does the advising leader or observe, understand that part of their role is ensuring that best practices are being used and keeping the leaders accountable to what, how things should be working. And, and if not, do they know that part of their responsibility is reporting back to us? When you have your, your week leaders attending advisory council meetings, are you doing more than just asking for a report? And the report is, oh, everything's going great. We had a wonderful meeting last week. Do you have questions to ask to make sure that, that they are being on time, that their paperwork is ready, their reservations are done? And are you bold enough to intervene and offer the support if it's needed? Are you brave enough to get involved and to mentor those potential leaders that need more training or growth in an area of their life? Are you brave enough to be confronting and inspire change? Because sometimes confrontation is uncomfortable but needs to be done. Amen. So one of those hows is leadership development. The second important how that we want to talk about is communication. We can find a blessing in effective communication in everything that we do in our operations as an advisory council. Effective communication ties the volunteers to the community. That is, the more they know about what you are doing as an advisory council, the more they have the opportunity to buy into it, feel like it's what they are doing and to become involved in what is being done. So it links those volunteers to the advisory council and to the community in general. Good communication clearly puts the community, that is the advisory council and the volunteers that work with that, into a relationship with the larger whole of Cairo. You know, we talk about reports. Reports are important, but reports given with the idea of communicating to the state committee, to the Cairo staff, um, that how things are going in detail, just the way Patty talked about the in-depth kind of questions that need to be asked of your leaders. But can we then bring those things to a focus 
that lets the broader community know about what you're doing and gives us cause to think about what's important for us to let the broader community know about what we're doing and how are we working towards being on the same track in that regard. Good communication increases the awareness of the purpose and activities of Kairos. When we talk about what we're doing, the greater the understanding will be of what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Good communication assures that the broadest number of people are made aware of what's going on. That information about events, information about activities, information about what it costs, information about what we need to do in order to raise funds or what we need to do in order to get more volunteers. That kind of information provided to the broadest community possible helps people understand what our purpose is and what we need to be doing. Okay, Betty. So communication within our local communities is pretty obvious, isn't it? It's how we get everything done. But remember that our local community, that one institution we serve, or that one group of ladies in, that you're serving in, uh, outside, that's only part of what Kairos Prison Ministry International is. When we start to figure out how to collaborate with others in our state, and maybe even nearby states, we will become so much stronger. I realize it's difficult enough just communicating with our local community. But if you broaden the, the, if you broaden the idea to include all your other advisory councils in your state and beyond, imagine how exciting it could be to be accomplishing greater things. Um, for example, I serve in Maryland and Kairos, Delaware, Kairos outside in Delaware is very close. And we have, um, and so when they need um, participants, to have invitations sent out, they often reach out to us and we try to find them people because there's areas that it's easier for someone to attend in Delaware than in, in Maryland. Um, think about, um, they can, um, let's see, do you know where the fundraisers are that are happening around your state so that you can support them? So um, think about joining forces for having large, Spectacular, imagine a crab feed with more than one advisory council um, participating. Oh. It spreads the work and a lot of crabs get eaten. Or have you thought about having a festival? It's, it's too overwhelming for one advisory council to do that kind of fundraising and event. But remember I told you fundraising and recruit, recruitment go hand in hand and coming together and building relationships works in that or having a yard sale together. So it's not just a few people doing one thing. We're coming together as a larger group and accomplishing more together. Um, fill in the blank, be creative. And as our training for advisory council says, creative but legal, <laughs> more, yeah. more working together. But doing this, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It takes effort to get to know more people to know your counterparts in the state chapter committee and nearby advisory councils. But I wanna remind you that communication within our advisory councils and to the states is more than just um, a meeting report. We need to start knowing what is going on so that we can support each other, knowing what is going on outside of our small little box so that we can be supportive to the larger ministry at whole. The fact that we have two slides related to communication ought to provide a clue. Communication is one of the most, one of the vital tools that connect us not only with the community with which we work, but with the broader Kairos body 
that we rely on and need to do our work effectively. So we want to talk a little bit more about how to improve your communication. Some of the tools, and I would guess as advisory council members, you have heard about these tools and are probably using these tools, but we want you to look at them for a moment as communication tools. Kairos Messenger, of course, lets you know who the people are within your community and what they're doing. So you can then tailor your communication to those people in relationship to what they are doing. Messenger has built into it email systems that enable you to quickly and easily contact everybody that is a volunteer in your community. Obviously a wonderful communication tool. More and more advisory councils have their own websites. You know, as I know, the first thing that most of us do when we want to get more information about something is we look for a website. And if your website is there and accessible and it's clear about what you do, when you're gonna do it, how people who are interested in doing it with you can contact you, then you've got a great communication tool. If you don't have an advisory council website, look to your state website and make sure that as an advisory council, you are present on that website in terms of what your plans are, who your leaders are, what kind of contact information people know if they want to work with you. Make sure it's there and available on the internet. Social media is a good communication tool. Facebook. Instagram are ways of getting that information out. The key to using social media well is accuracy. Making sure the information is accurate because once it's out there, it's out there forever. So make sure it's accurate, positive, and reflects well on what our mission as an advisory council, part of Kairos ministry is all about. Patty's talked about the value of Zoom, lots of training opportunities through Zoom, lots of ways of communicating with each other. Um, we've learned how to do it pretty effectively during the pandemic, keep using it. Many people suffer from getting their advisory council together or volunteers together because of distances. Zoom is one answer to bringing people together and helping them talk and learn with each, from each other. So use those internet communication tools that are available to you and build them into your program. Making people aware of events, you know, there's nothing more frustrating, and, and Patty has touched on this, than having a wonderful event planned and hearing over and over again, I never heard about it, or I didn't know about it, or nobody told me about it. So think about the events you want to hold. Think about how you're going to get that information out, and think about how else you're going to get that information out, and then think about how else you're going to get that information about people need to be told over and over and over again about things. So they th then can buy into it and become part of it. And if they are events worth participating in, you will find that they grow and become more important within that sense. So we wanna make sure that our communication obviously is timely. Um, Dick mentioned over and over again. So we wanna make sure that people have some time to put it on their calendar, but not just one time on their calendar. They need to be reminded as the event becomes closer, as the meeting time comes closer or the training comes closer, um, have ways of, to be communicating with the people who have showed interest in it. And I'm gonna share, and to be good communication, it needs to be truly informative and valuable. 
So when we talk about using social media and websites, are, the, are, are you using them and are they um, just the same information on there and it never changes? Or do you have constantly encouraging messages on there? On social media, the importance of engagement can't be ignored. And so we wanna make sure that if you have, if you're using these methods of communication, which are effective, but they need to be interesting also, and they need to be informative, it needs to be valuable. Because we're always looking for ways to increase our relationships. And I'm gonna to have to face it, I have, I have friends who, who have the largest friends online and that's where they are, spend most of their time. So we need to start using these things. But if you're a communications coordinator out there and you're going, oh my, I can't do another thing. This is what we're talking about, informing and managing the skills and, and um, that you have in your volunteers. Let them know what you need because you have people that are social media whizzes and amazing on websites and they can help keep keep those things running it doesn't have to be just those of us on advisory council doing these this information we have to make sure that it's being done well timely accurate and informative but we don't have to be the ones punching the buttons all the time so um and i'm sure that there are other tools that your advisory councils are using and if if we haven't talked about them and you're listening to this then reach out to the to your state, reach out to other advisory councils, reach out and let it be known how, how success the successes you're having and share it with those of us who are seeking creative ways to, to um, engage our volunteers and serve our communities. So we've talked about the hows of leadership development, the hows of effective communication. You can also find the blessing of being a strong advisory council in how you plan. Good planning is an effective tool to strengthen what you do. And it also brings you into a relationship with the broader Kairos body. Know what your needs are. Start each meeting, each event, with defining what the purpose is, what we need to accomplish. Know what your needs are, and then begin to develop the tools and means necessary to meet those needs. Evaluation is an essential part of planning, knowing how we did. You have tools to really important ones that you're aware of, I'm sure, is the Excellent Initiative. And the other one is Ezra. Both of those are wonderful evaluation tools. The answer is the questions, how did we do? Did we do everything we were supposed to do? If we didn't do everything we were supposed to do, what do we need to improve the next weekend or the next activity? It's increasingly important overcome the resistance that still exists all these years after the excellent initiative was introduced to this idea that it's you're you're watching me you want to catch me in a mistake one of the most effective ways of dealing with that is to involve the weekend leader or the person whose weekend is being evaluated by excellent initiative in the initial process. Let them know what the questions are gonna be. Let them know who's gonna be doing it. Get somebody who's gonna be there all the time to evaluate. Unless you do effective evaluation, you don't have a basis for planning. Know what your goals are. We've said that a thousand times, I'm sure. But it makes sense when you sit down to have an advisory council meeting to say, this is what we want to accomplish every time. What's the goal of this meeting? What's the goal for two months from now? What's the goal for five months from now? What's the goal for next year? Know 
what the benchmarks are. That comes back to that issue, not of individual accountability, but of the council's advice, uh, accountability. How do we measure if we're doing that? And you have those tools in, in Ezra, in um, the other kind of software programs that enable you to see how you've done. Evaluate progress a step at a time. Do you need to shift? Do you need to stay in the course? And then use the tools, use the tools that you can use. One of the things I wanna say about planning is planning allows you to feel the joy of accomplishment because by having a plan, you know when you've arrived, when you've got it done. And that sense of accomplishment is one of the great motivators of a strong advisory council. And it holds you up to the standards set by the body as a whole to let you know where you stand. And when you find out you are one of the best, most effective advisory council in of all those hundreds of advisory councils, how do you know? You know by planning and setting some goals. Good planning allows you then the joy of accomplishment and it also allows you the freedom to adjust your operation by tracking your goals. In other words, it enables change. We all need to adjust. We've had to do a heck of a lot of adjusting over the last year. Some of it we weren't ready for. So we were scrambling constantly to figure out how do we keep our volunteers together? How do we keep our relationship with the institutions we serve? How do we keep our relationship with the communities we've developed of women and young people that are affected by incarceration? Those all required adjustment, new ways of doing it. And if you had an idea of what you wanted to accomplish to begin with, you had a tool by which you could adjust to the realities as they existed. So that's important. And when we talk about planning, there's so many things to consider because when we talk about goals, it's, it's just a blanket out there, but we have goals in recruitment and we have goals in fundraising and we have goals in motivation. And, and when we um, take the time and set specific times to do planning as an advisory council and a time to um, evaluate and celebrate our uh, successes, we have, we build um, spirit within our mission, within our ministry. So I also wanna remind you that um, if you've been on advisory council for a while, you might know all about the planning that you have been doing as an advisory council, but you have new people coming on all the time. So I'm, ask, I'm asking, do you have a calendar that you can hand your new people that doesn't have more than just your meetings and your weekends on it? Um, because we know those happen, but so many times people do not know all that goes into the, what you, you do on advisory councils to keep the ministry going well. So are your fundraisers on it? How about, I, I encourage you to think outside of just your advisory council. Do you know the fundraisers of your, of your neighboring advisory councils that, and are you supporting each other? Do you know do, when the reunions are and the retreats should be on there. So that's kind of obvious too, but um, you know, there are deadlines for making reservations. There are deadlines for making requests and putting in paperwork. And, um, and so new people, those things get dropped by the wayside sometimes, and then you're caught scrambling or unable to complete uh, the plans that you had made because you didn't keep track of those deadlines. This information is important for everyone on your advisory council and any of your volunteers who you have recruited to be supportive of your, of your goals and meeting your needs, to have an understanding of. Everyone must know how to keep these things in order so that nothing falls through the cracks and we can run like a well-oiled machine. Amen. I encourage you, if you don't set aside spe specific times to do planning 
and to assign people to make sure that things are on track, make sure that it's clearly, um, it's clearly stated to whoever is in charge or whoever is responsible for a part of your plan. These things need to be set down so that everyone is aware of how things move that and our plans can be successful then. Our advisory councils change every year. You know that people leave sometimes expectedly, sometimes unexpectedly. New people come on board. We hope so. So there needs to be a plan for how you include new people and how you keep continuing people aware of what the needs of the advisory council are. So having system a place, a place to orient everyone, the new people and the continuing people. I mentioned earlier about that assumption sometimes we fall prey to that people know. And that's particular about experienced people. They've been around for a while. They know what's going on. Orientation, make sure that that assumption is valid. So do that. Now this slide lists a number of the tools. We've talked about this, a number of them also, but one of those tools we wanna to talk about or want to remind you of is the Advisory Council Operating Procedures. That's a vital document. Make sure every orientation you have is involves it and maybe take a piece out of it and talk about that at your advisory council meetings so people are brought up to speed. Recognize that that has changed every year, not dramatically, not drastically, but there are changes you need to be aware of and you need to orient your council to those changes. So be careful. Focus in on our mission, our vision, and our values in your orientation. Agendas ought to reflect our mission and our vision. Discussions, devotionals, those kinds of things that you open your meetings with need to focus on our values and our statement of faith. That keeps people focused on the fundamentals of what we are as an organization and ties us to the greater body because everybody is related to those that mission, those, that vision, those values and that statement of faith. So make sure it's part of what you do. MyCairos.org, we've mentioned that a few times, but make sure that everyone is aware of it Cite an instance where you want people on your advisory council to look up information, hold them accountable. So when you talk to them next, did you find that? What did you find out? What are the difficulties you had? Get them thinking about using mykairos.org as a fundamental tool. That tool creates that relationship with the broader Kairos body, and it gives you the strength to work with good ideas, best practices, and other information that can make you a more effective advisory council. We are charged with recruiting ourselves out of a position. We need to have ways of passing that information on to those that come behind us or that come alongside of us. We need to have ways of mentoring people and bringing them up. It's very easy to assume people know how things are supposed to be done because they've served on many teams or they've been around forever. Um, but that is not true. I have met people who have not read the operating procedures. Shocking, I know, but it's our responsibility as a member of advisory council to, know, to make sure that people are informed and that they're taking advantage of the trainings available to them and the information and resources. So um, we need to make sure that, you know, we have these elections every year and we bring people on 
we need to make sure that people understand what the position's responsibilities are before we have the second phase of the elections. Uh, make sure everyone is aware of those operating procedure and the job descriptions and where to find them at. Encourage everyone to try new positions. It's very easy to just say, oh, you've been in secretary last year for the last two years. Do you want to continue doing that? We need to be encouraging each other to broaden our skills and broaden our understanding of the Kairos um, way. Um, make sure that we need to make sure that the most people know the functions of Kairos. And after the elections happen, and they've been inputted by the um, secretary, and when do those elections need to be done by? Do you know that? Um, you know, they need to be completed by November, the first phase, so that by December you can have your you can have your second phase with positions because by the end of the year, those positions need to be inputted. And, and um, so once those are, your secretary is gonna receive back um, co access codes. You need to make sure that everyone has access to the tools that they need on your advisory councils. Your communications needs to be able to get, needs to have access to Kairos Messenger. Um, if they don't, your, your um, Kairos donor coordinator needs to have access to Kairos donor, they're unable to do their jobs. And, um, and believe it or not, it happens that people don't have that. We need to have access to, um, the, and the secretary must know that they have to pass on those positions. So, so being aware of positions and the responsibilities, that's part of our responsibility is making sure people have an understanding of, of what's entailed, um, and if they're if they're uh, fault, if they're struggling to to meet the standards of that, then we come alongside of them and we we um, give them some support and we and we help them come along so that they can be doing their jobs well. I haven't ever met anybody who didn't want to serve Kairos with excellence, the best that they could, um, and so. I encourage you to make sure that you're attending uh, the advisory council operating procedure trainings that are offered, and um, and the advising and the advanced Kairos trainings, having people so that you understand what is going on in the background, and you can pass that on to your volunteers at whole. Okay, so we've talked about a number of tools, or a number of what I call how tos in terms of being an effective, strong advisory council. There's one more we want to mention, and that is finding the blessing of ministry in unity. We are, as we are asked to remind ourselves all the time, one ministry, three programs. So what is it about the community that's important? Why is it important for members of one community, say a Kairos Insight community, to know about another community, a Kairos Outside community? Why is it important for the um, young people that are involved in TORCH to know about what's going on in Kairos Inside or Kairos Outside? So ask yourself that question every time you work with your specific community as an advisory council. Ask yourself, how might the people in this community be better served by knowing about and taking advantage of other programs? And more importantly than that, or after that, ask the question, how might you most effectively make the community we serve aware of the services or opportunities or benefits provided by the other programs. There are some kind of traditional ways we've done that over the years. We've invited Kairos outside representative to Kairos inside closed um, activities. We've provided information to key people I, my experience is with inside, and I know about working with chaplains and providing them with information. 
but it's much more than that. It is follow up. You know, we talk about recruiting not being effective unless it leads eventually to a face to face relationship between another person in which you ask them to be part of Kairos. Interacting between the programs is the same thing. We can provide all the brochures we want, they're important. We can invite people to talk about those programs to other programs, that's important. But follow up, knowing who wants to get the information, making sure they get that information where it's supposed to go, and then making sure it is responded to. When that happens, amazing things happen. Wonderful testimonials on kpmi.org, videos that talk about what happens when somebody on Kairos Inside becomes aware of and becomes involved on behalf of a loved one in Kairos Outside. Wonderful things happen. And that strengthens who we are and ties us to the broader community. When I think about all of us working together and getting outside of our own individual advisory council, I get excited. And I get excited because we can be so much more together. And too often, we don't know enough about other programs to even know where to begin. Yes, we know that Torch serves youth. We know that Kairos Outside um, serves women impacted by um, incarceration. And we know that families are changed. We know that residents inside institutions are changed on, um, are changed when they under, start to understand forgiveness and the idea that there's they can choose to live a different life. But sometimes we we don't know enough about how to operate within those other um, other ministries. For example, did you know that a woman can attend a Kairos outside even if she isn't sponsored by a Kairos graduate? So how do you do that? Well, <laughs> we have, and and even if they are, I've I've gone to prayer and shares inside, and somebody had um, a graduate had looked in that envelope for all those brochures and papers, but had no idea what to do with it. So we have to be supportive and understanding of the process of how do we use those reservation forms for Kairos outside so that we can be supporting and, and advocating for them so that we can have this incredible impact. So, you know, the form, our favorite website, you're probably tired of hearing about this. Our favorite website is mykairos.org. You can get the reservation forms on there and they can be submitted to your um, your lo local Kairos outside community. But did you know that you can also fill out a, a reservation form online on mykairos.org? Um, and if you ever wondered what happens to those application, did you know that there is a video explaining um, what happens to the application? And I've heard people ask, so how do I sponsor across state lines? Um, I have somebody that wants to go, but they're in Florida and I'm in Indiana or Ohio or wherever. And, and so it's a matter of finding out where the local Cairo Southside is located and you send it to them. If you do the application online, um, it will be sent automatically to the appropriate Cairo Southside community, the closest one um, that will be able to offer support to, to, the, to our women. And um, did you know that those Kairos outside ladies come at no cost and that oftentimes they're driven there? Um, and so of course we need to be supporting fundraising with each other. Um, do, you, um, do you know who is fundraising and what they're doing? Um, do you know when other programs around you need team or participants? Or when is Flowers at Dawn? Well, what is Flowers at Dawn and how can we support it? Um, and when are they happening? What, when are the closings going on? So communication amongst all of us, that is what makes our one ministry serving in unity so powerful. Because when we serve together, we're tremendous. We should know how to pray specifically for each other. We should be collaborating in fundraising and recruiting. We should be sharing all parts of the Kairos story when we talk about Kairos, not just the part that we are 
most active in. We all know people who have been impacted by incarceration. You're standing in line with them in the store. You're sitting beside them in church. When we share, we offer a way out of the shame and secrecy that's often in, um, associated with, it, with um, incarceration. If we get out of our own box, we will be tremendously better together. We will find blessings and be a blessing to more people and have a greater impact on our communities. Okay, we've covered a lot in the last hour and 15 minutes or so. We want you to think about what it is that we've talked about and process that information and provide some feedback. These are questions you, we'd like you to ask. What challenges have you experienced in your efforts to unify your advisory council activities in your state and the Kairos body as a whole? With the state committee, with the Kairos Prison Ministry International, where does it fit as you look at what you're doing in relationship to the operating procedures or the Asian? for the state admission of Kairos Prison Ministry. And in what ways has your advisory council found the blessings of integration into the Kairos body as a whole? We'd like you to take a few minutes to think about that. And if we can extend the time of this presentation a little bit, we'll give you an opportunity to share with us. So think about it for a few minutes, and then we will proceed from there. As we close, we have a slide in front of you that says, don't forget who and why we serve, the broadest possible sense of what Kairos prison ministry is all about. We serve as disciples of Christ. Throughout this training, then, we've tried to bring together or to tie together a number of descriptions of what the nature of an advisory council is, what a good advisory council is. We've talked about some of the hows of how you become a strong advisory council, but undergirding all of that and tying all that together is how that brings your advisory council into a relationship with the body as a whole and how the body of a whole can be more supportive and more meaningful in terms of impacting what you do as you seek to serve those who Christ calls us to serve, those impacted by incarceration. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. And we will be looking forward to hearing how you function as an advisory council. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you all for coming. And um, I'd like to close us out in prayer. Wonderful. Father God, I just um, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I thank you for the people who have come to volunteer. I thank you for the, for the army that you have put together to make changes in, in our communities um, across the world and the, uh, the blessings of forgiveness um, that Kairos offers and the blessings of growth. Lord, I just ask that you continue to bring, to bring passion to our lives for Kairos and to share that passion with other people because we know that your Holy Spirit changes people. It guides us, it gives us direction, it makes us, and, and your work in us makes us so much more than who we ever were before we came to know your son, Jesus. And we just are so um, grateful for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you will do. We just look forward in anticipation to what we have in, um, in coming up. We, uh, Lord, I ask that you open everyone's eyes to what you have in store Make us creative and let us see the opportunity and seize them to share the joy of your love 
with each, with each other and with the people that you bring into our um, sphere of influence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.